Thank you, Hugh. Good evening. Welcome to Monday's Look North, our top story tonight. Police and fire crews targeted and the death of a teenager in Halifax. We have the latest after a series of bonfire night incidents. Normally this area is a very quiet area, but that night it is like out of a movie. It's getting like a war. Have you never watched fights between people and police? This is what we, we watch every night. Plus the Doncaster display that had to be stopped after fireworks shot sideways straight towards the crowd. Are fireworks a nuisance where you live? Should they be banned? We'll speak to the fire service and get your views too. Also tonight, the king is to visit Yorkshire for the first time since ascending the throne. We reveal where you can see him this week. And the feline-friendly family who've sold their business, their car, even their wedding rings to care for cats. A windy and often very mild week to come across Yorkshire. Join me for that week ahead forecast. Hello, good evening. How was your weekend? It felt like a war zone or a horror movie. That's how residents caught up in bonfire night disorder across Yorkshire have described their experiences. Fire crews and police officers were targeted as fireworks were hurled. In Halifax, a 17-year-old boy died after being discovered injured in a garden following reports of fireworks being set off. That incident has been referred to the police watchdog. Sabia Pavez has more. These were the scenes that played out on Vickerman Street in Halifax on bonfire night. <laughs> Fireworks launched like missiles, unflinchingly indifferent to who or what they'd hit. Today the streets were silent. The discarded wrappers of the fireworks scattered on the ground bore witness to the scenes that played out here over the weekend. Scenes that ended with the untimely death of a 17-year-old. The teenager died in hospital after he was discovered in a garden at about quarter past eight on Saturday evening. Those who live here on Vickerman Street in Halifax told us this isn't the first time they've witnessed and experienced antisocial behaviour on bonfire night. They told us they've been left terrorised by the incidents that took place over the weekend. Normally this area is a very quiet area, but that night it is like out of a movie. It's literally like out of a movie. It is horrible. We were standing just in the garden to see. And even when we were standing in the garden, ambulance and police came, the children were still standing on the corner and were still throwing the crack, crackers at us and we had to run. I had to leave the house and uh, this is not something I just did that night because I don't want to tell something, but it's something that I do every year. Uh, because of what's happening here every five walks night. A cordon is in place at the property where the boy was found injured. It's not yet been confirmed how the 17-year-old died, but because police were in the area at the time, West Yorkshire Police have now referred themselves to the Independent Office for Police Conduct. Elsewhere in Leeds, officers protected by riot shields marched through the streets near Hyde Park, pelted by fireworks with each stride. It was a bit scary to be fair. It was like well loud. We could like, we kind of locked our doors and that because they were throwing them at people. So we were like, we didn't know what to do. So we just stayed in all night. It's not right that the police and emergency services had fireworks thrown at them and obviously it was, yeah, it was mental around here. I went home for the weekend because I definitely didn't want to be around um, here for it because, yeah, it's quite intimidating. Look at the car, fam, yo! In Sheffield, South Yorkshire Fire Service have confirmed a car was set on fire and fireworks were launched at a bus driving past. Although West and South Yorkshire Fire Services reported fewer incidents this year than previous years, there's a concern that next time there may be more casualties. Sabir Pavez, BBC Look North. Well, some of you have been in touch on this. Thank you for your comments. Kev says, uh, fireworks should be sold for official organised events only, not for public use. Mrs H says, I don't think this should be banned, but silent ones are probably the way to go. Sue Billcliffe says, bonfire night is now called bonfire season. It does go on a long time, doesn't it? And Wayne suggests that a permit system could work. Simon says, lots of fun had by all. Still a great family tradition. Thanks for getting in touch. Well, I've been speaking to Dave Dave Walton from West Yorkshire Fire Service to find out how this year compares to others in terms of antisocial behaviour.
We intended it about 120 incidents over the weekend. Uh, 33 of those were directly attributable to either fireworks or bonfires. It was a fairly steady weekend in the grand scheme of things when you compare it to other similar weekends across different years as well, but, but certainly enough to keep us busy for the weekend. And how much extra pressure does Bonfire Night put on your crews? It puts a lot of pressure on, on crews. We've seen some of the antisocial behaviour where that happens, but that's something we prepare for th throughout the year. Um, planning starts in the summer, but it's it's not a nice environment to work in when people are attacking you when you are trying to do your job. Uh, but that's something we work with our crews to prepare them for and, and give them different ways of dealing with that as well. The police were targeted. W were you as well? Uh, yeah, there were four occasions when our crews were targeted whilst they were doing their job. Uh, and I must pass on my thanks to West Yorkshire Police for protecting our crews as they did their job. Uh, fortunately, none of the four incidents that involved our crews resulted in either injuries or, or, or damage to our vehicles. But there were four incidents too many. There shouldn't be any incidents of people being attacked just for doing their job. How does it make you feel that you are there to protect the public, yet you've been targeted? I think it's all too easy just to say that it's part of the job, uh, because it's not. Um, but we will work with communities, we will work with different groups of people just to try and s stop this happening because everybody that's out there, be they police officers, fire officers, ambulance officers, um, we're just somebody's husbands, fathers, mothers, daughters, whatever, just trying to do our job. So it, it's something that we don't relish and it's something we work around, but it shouldn't be happening. We hear from residents that this sort of behaviour happens every year around bonfire night. What's been done to stamp it out? There's a lot being done in different communities to do that. And we are really talking about a very small minority of people that, that give us the problems uh, on Bonfire Night. I think there's some really good examples. If you look in the Hare Hills area of Leeds, for example, there's a, the Catch Youth Project. They put on three nights of diversionary activities for young people. They were able to go into the Catch Centre, they were able to eat, different activities were on, just to keep them away from the temptation and some of the activities that were happening not too far away, uh, and perhaps talk to them about a better way and also about respect for the emergency services as well. We know that Leeds in particular cancelled their free bonfire this year. Does that have any impact on the antisocial behaviour that you've seen? No, we, we, we've taken a look at our figures and I can't honestly say that we've picked up any discernible trend that, that, that points to the removal of, of those larger, more organised displays um, showing through in our figures this year. Dave Walton from West Yorkshire Fire Service, thank you for your time. Thanks, Amy. In South Yorkshire, a charity group say it's deeply sorry after a fireworks display went wrong. A spectator filmed the moment rockets fired into the crowd at the Tick Hill and District Lines display. An investigation has begun as Tom Ingle reports. At first, the fireworks at Tick Hill Lions annual display delight the crowds. But then, suddenly, things change. Instead of launching upwards, rockets fire into the crowd. Stuart Norman from Doncaster was at the display on Saturday night. I saw one of the fireworks fall over and it was just like flying everywhere on the floor, bouncing. One it, and I, something in, in the middle of the ground bounced back and hit one of the people that were lighting the fireworks and it just exploded in his face. Move back. Move back. Move back. Stuart says he's been before and it's usually well attended and well organised. It took place at Tickhill Cricket Club. At lunchtime today, the groundsman was back at work on the pitch. We understand there were minor injuries in the crowd. The fireworks that fell over ended up shooting towards the Cricket Club pavilion behind me. Tickhill and District Lions today have released a statement saying they are deeply sorry for everyone who was injured or scared by the incident. They add a full investigation is underway with the relevant authorities. No disrespect to the Lions and everything, it's normally pretty, really, really well organised, but this year it was just like, there were no, no marshals or anything there, and it was just basically lack of security and protection for the crowd. Stuart is just grateful he was standing with his family well away from where the fireworks landed. Tom Ingle, BBC Look North, Tick Hill. You're watching Monday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. We look at what's behind the rise in the number of children needing speech and language support in schools.
OK, let's bring you some news in brief now. A man has been shot by police in Doncaster. Officers were called to a shop on Rockingham Road in Wheatley following reports of a man with a gun. A 27-year-old has been arrested on suspicion of possessing a firearm and intent to endanger life. He was treated for injuries at hospital. One eyewitness says he, at first he thought the gunshots were fireworks. This afternoon, I was on a call with a colleague as well then. The police knocked on my door. As soon as I saw them and I saw the whole scene at that point, I immediately remembered what the sound I heard in the morning. And it was three times, bam, 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 yeah. That was like the sound. Peel Group have confirmed they're still in talks with a potential buyer over Doncaster Sheffield Airport following its closure on Friday. It comes as emotional footage has been released of the final takeoff. Communications between TUI Pilot and Doncaster Air Traffic Control have been shared online with the pilot thanking airport staff. Doncaster, on behalf of all of us at TUI, thank you for your support and being part of our team. The runway and buildings form an airport, but it's the people here who really are its all. Godspeed and tailwinds all the way. Thank you. Don't get one, Del Sheriff. Thanks very much for that. From all of us up here in the tower, uh, both past and present, and our colleagues in the fire section and in engineering and across the airport. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you these last 17 years, and I hope we get to do it all again very, very soon. Oh, certainly an emotional exchange, that, isn't it? Now, for Royal Watchers, this is going to be quite a week with His Majesty the King visiting Yorkshire for the first time since ascending the throne. King Charles and his wife Camilla, Queen Consort, will carry out a number of engagements over two days. Get your pen and paper ready, because Phil Bobmer has been looking at the royal itinerary and he can tell us more. Quite a lot of detail in this, isn't it, Phil? There is, Amy, and uh, I have to say we can't give specific timings as such like, but uh, unusually we have been given a little bit more detail of advanced information about this particular trip. Now, the King and Queen concert will be here for two days, visiting West, North and South Yorkshire. The tour will begin in Bradford tomorrow when the King will visit the head office of the supermarket chain Morrisons to hear about how it's helping customers with the cost of living crisis. His Majesty will then travel to Centenary Square for a reception with young leaders from across the district. We're told the bells of City Hall will even ring to the tune of Only Climor Bartat. From Bradford, the royal party will travel on to Leeds, where the King will view some of the artwork in the form of the world reimagined globes in front of the library and the art gallery. The royal visitors will also meet representatives from child-friendly Leeds. We're incredibly excited about it because he's chosen Leeds to come early in his reign. He's going to be unveiling a plaque celebrating 10 years of Child Friendly Leeds, which feels incredibly special because it was launched by his mother, the late Queen, 10 years ago in her Golden Jubilee year. Well, the visits will then take in an exhibition exploring the lives of second-generation West Indians of Leeds and then meet representatives of the city's financial sector. On Wednesday, the King and Queen concert will be in York. As is customary, the monarch will enter through the historic Micklegate Bar before heading to the Minster. There they will take part in a short service before the King unveils a statue of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I think it's incredibly poignant and, and almost the fact that it's happening in the Queen's Platinum Jubilee year and yet she passed away. There's so many emotions that will be running through the day, um, both of gratitude to Her Majesty the Queen and what she did, and, um, and obviously going forward to have the King there and all that we hope and wish for his future. And finally, the King and Queen concert will travel to Doncaster, where they will confer city status. And before attending a reception at the Mansion House, Doncaster was one of a number of towns that successfully bid, as you may remember, to become a city. And its winning bid was commended for a sense of community spirit, rich history and royal links. Amy. Phil, thank you. Well, it's going to be quite an eventful couple of days, isn't it? If you do manage to get a glimpse of the, qu the King and Queen consort, we'd love to hear from you. Send us any videos and photos that you get. Next night, the number of five- and six-year-olds who need speech and language support at school has risen. And experts believe it's partly due to lockdown limiting social interactions. Some parts of Yorkshire have seen 40% more children needing help. And teachers warn ignoring the problem can have long-term educational impacts. Abigiola has more. There is no track for the truck. These nursery pupils in Halifax are getting extra sessions to improve their speech and language skills. Many of them were struggling to communicate when they started school. 
So we're seeing issues right across the age range. So from the early years, children coming in with less language than we'd like them to have, it impacts on their learning and their ability to play and interact together. So they might not understand what's being said to them. They might not be able to follow long instructions. They might struggle to use their language to interact with each other or to explain what they want or even what they need. Wendy's team work in around 100 schools across Yorkshire. Data gathered by the BBC found that nationally the number of children needing speech and language help increased by 10% over the last year. But here in Calderdale, it's risen 40%. Particularly since the start of the pandemic, we see more and more children coming to school who need extra help. If you think about it, if they're coming at three and four years old, the first couple of years uh, of their lives, a lot of socialisation has been missing because they've not had shared experience. Um, the vocabulary uh, is certainly much more limited because they've not had the same level of experiences or gone to uh, a range of places they previously would do. The extra sessions are paid for out of already stretched school budgets. So the interventions that are absolutely needed for children um, they're the sorts of things that might have to go away as budgets are stripped back further. And it's not just in Halifax that more children need support with speech and language. It's happening in other parts of Yorkshire too. In Barnsley and Wakefield, it's up by more than 30%. And in North Yorkshire, there's been an increase of 25%. Three-year-old Seamus from Scarborough has been on the NHS waiting list to see a speech therapist for a year, but there's a huge backlog. Nationally, 65,000 under-18s are on that list. We feel like if he'd been seen sooner, we would have been able to work on things a lot easier. Now I feel that he's sort of fallen behind again, and even though he's coming on so well... He's going to really struggle when he goes to preschool, when he starts school, because he's not had this catch-up time that would have made such a difference. The Department for Education say up to £180 million worth of government funding over the next three years will go towards children's development in their earliest years. Schools and parents say it's... ...support that's urgently needed. Abby Jayola, BBC Look North. And in the Championship, there was a stunning victory for Sheffield United at home against Championship leaders Burnley. Burnley were 2-1 up at half-time, but Ollie McBurney equalised immediately after the break with this diving header. Then, after a bit of a scramble, Jack Robinson put the Blades ahead for the first time. Anil Ahmed Hoddick made it 4-2 from six yards and McBurney slid home his second goal for Sheffield United, ending their four-game winless run at home with a resounding 5-2 win. Now, food to make 600 meals has been donated by runners as part of a unique entry fee for a race at Grenaside Woods in Sheffield. Hillsborough and Rivlin Running Club organised the donation day relay with participants bringing along items of food to be donated to S6 Food Bank. Three, two, one, go. Oh, it's been great. It's been a really, really lovely morning. Nice to all get out together, run with, you know, the runners. Have a real sense of kind of like all participating and also giving back to the community. And yeah, hopefully all the donations are kind of well used and, and help help people um, kind of out there that are struggling at the moment. Guys, thank you. Is the run all right? No. <laughs> everybody has a part to play in helping in some of these circumstances and you might nev never meet anybody who uses food bank but actually just the thought of you donating £10 or donating a tin of food goes a long way to helping somebody out of their circumstances that they're in at this present time. I think it's just to give something back to the community that we're running. Obviously, it's Hillsborough Rivlin Running Club. So just some donations to give back to the community to help in hard times. For us at the Sheffield Six Food Banks, this means a lot because we really believe that food banks are about community helping community. And for us, that's really important. And this is just a, such a great version of all communities coming out and doing something they absolutely love, but also uh, bringing food along to the event at the same time. Sign of the times, isn't it? Now, how much do you love your pets? Well, a family from Filey have sold their business, their car, even their wedding rings to fund their cat rescue mission. The Lewis family, who started taking in stray cats last year, says they now have more than 100 and they desperately need more help to rehome them. Nicola Reese has been to meet them. Hello. 
<laughs> so this is their old room. And as you can see, now it is very much just a cat room. There's cat trees galore. I told my husband I needed to bring them in and he asked the question, where are they going? And it was our bedroom and that's, uh, we moved out of our bedroom. They have a little cat flap in the corner of the room and it goes out into a green box outside with steps inside it and they make their way down there and they are in a big spacious run with lots of places to hide and trees to climb out there as well. My name's Kate and this is my mum Tina and my dad Mark and we have over a hundred cats at our house at the moment. I have about 30 litter trays in the house and about 40 cat trees in the house. So yes, it's their house, not ours anymore. <laughs> You're going out? Come on, shoddy! In the first lockdown, we realised that there was a real problem there and that cats didn't really have anywhere to go. And we got a call from a farm. They were overrun with cats and didn't know what to do. So we rescued 18 straight away one day and that's where it all began. This is our kitchen, but this through here used to be our dining room where we would have our Christmas dinners and stuff. This is actually our dining room table, which is now covered in donut beds for the cats to sit in. You want some beef, Bruno? Is that a yes? You know, a month ago I had 47 cats, and now I have 103 cats. I've got five pregnant mums, and we know that by the end of November, I will probably have 200 cats here. The food bills alone, you know, are, th are thousands of pounds. Come on, babies. We've sold a property, we've sold our car, we've sold even my wedding ring, um, just to, to, to get money for the place, but we have nothing else to actually sell. Come on, Freddy, you're going to see me. Come on, baby. The running costs here are crazy every month. It's around 4,000 pounds. And yeah, it does make me worry a little bit about the future because um, uh, we, we don't get to go on holidays anymore. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a different kind of life now to what we lived before. It's very difficult now uh, to imagine not having, not having any cats. I can't actually foresee that ever happening. They need help and whilst wherever we can, we're going to help them. It was very exciting back in March when we finally got the official charity registered. Um, the animals are absolutely everything to my mum and dad. My dad wasn't particularly into animals when they, um, when they got married, but over the years, my mum has transformed him into uh, much more of an animal lover now, and uh, he definitely couldn't live without them. Can you climb up there? This is my life forever. I won't do anything else. I'm like, this is all I want to do. Wow, the Lewis family really like cats. If you think you'd like to rescue a cat, obviously there's lots there I'm sure that they'd love to hear from you and have a bit of help. What do you make of that, Paul? How many cats in the master bedroom? I'm not sure about the master bedroom, but 100 in, in the house. That's a crazy number, well, isn't it? You said only 200 by the end of November because I'm a pregnant. It'd be fragrant, wouldn't it? I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking how kind it was of them to take it's all Very these kind cats. indeed. Shall we have a look at the weather pictures that you've been sending in in the last uh, 24 hours? Now, that was Sunday morning uh, with fog in the valley bottom there, Harden near Bingley. There was a lot of fog in the Leeds area, actually, uh, Sunday morning, exacerbated by all that bonfire smoke. That was about 9 o'clock on Sunday morning with the fog just about lifting uh, with some sunshine coming through. And that's at Wuthering Heights, Top Withens, a beautiful uh, picture there, Stanbury above Howarth. Keep the pictures coming in, Twitter, Instagram, and the Weather Watcher website. So tomorrow sees a continuation of a theme. It's windy, it's very mild, there'll be some sunshine and a few uh, showers. It is an unsettled sort of setup with uh, scattered showers into Wednesday. Uh, but later in the week, the, the flow backs off to the south or southwest. So another surge of warm air coming up from uh, Iberia means that uh, some spots, believe it or not, on Friday afternoon could reach 17 degrees Celsius, which is 63 Fahrenheit. Remarkable for the middle of uh, November. Now, there's a satellite picture. The clouds thinning a little bit. That's ahead of an active weather front that will bring some uh, heavy rain for a short period of time overnight and some strong and gusty winds, but it moves very quickly. Uh, by the end of the night, it's dry and clear. Another very mild night, temperatures coming in at 10 or 11 degrees. And so, 
um, for the high water times tomorrow, Filey 3.43, Bridlington at 3.55. So it's a lovely sunny start. I think through the morning we'll see uh, clouds building a little bit, sky turning partly cloudy, risk of a scattering of showers, but they'll move through fairly quickly. Temperatures again above average at uh, 14 degrees Celsius, very mild by the end of the week, perhaps as high as 17 degrees. How about that, Amy? So to say you're more of a dog person, isn't it? I love cats as well, I just can't get me around. So many. So many. <laughs> it's incredible. That's it from us. Good night.